platform, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, beginning to read from verse 1. I would encourage you in your own spare time, read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. It's a very uh, rich chapter in doctrine, and so I want to consider that tonight. So one of the most important most powerful dimensions of Christianity is the hope that it gives that physical death will not be the end. But through a resurrection, you and I are able to enter into God's kingdom and experience eternal life. This truth is anchored on the fact that Jesus Christ, our Lord, he defeated death and rose from the dead. Our text, or in our text, Paul is writing a letter to the church at Corinth, a church like this one. And in this portion of the letter, he's writing concerning the issue of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's actually correcting a false teaching which had crept into the church at Corinth where certain prominent men stood behind a pulpit and began to preach that uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was, did not happen. They, 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 they were teaching this, and news reached Paul, wherever he was, and he be- actually he was in prison, I think, and he began to put together this thought to challenge what was being spread in the local congregation. And, 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 and uh, that is what I want to consider tonight, The resurrection hope. The resurrection hope. Our text reads as follows. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, That which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present day, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, Then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who uh, uh, am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but, but, but the grace of God which was with me. Verse 11. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. Verse 16, for if the dead do not rise then Christ is not risen and if Christ is not risen your faith is futile you are still in your sins then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men the most pitiable verse 20 the Bible says but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive can you say amen tonight the resurrection hope and I mean oh, that's good news tonight that Christ is risen and because he's risen it gives us a hope that we too shall rise 
from the dead if we die should he tarry tonight so let me consider then number one the resurrection of christ so the background or the setting to our passage uh like i've mentioned is uh, here is a uh, paul he's defending the faith he's defending this truth uh, so let's define before we proceed tonight what resurrection is this is the coming back to life of one that had died uh, there were some in the corinthian church uh, leaders uh, even uh, a man of influence a man of prominence a man of uh, uh, positions of authority uh, who stood behind the sacred desk and began to speak against the resurrection of uh, the dead they they also questioned uh, the resurrection of Jesus. You can imagine, they're in church uh, and yet they are propagating uh, a, 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 a theory that Christ is not risen. And so my question to you, to them then is, why are you even in church? Because it's futility to be in church and yet be at a position where you are questioning the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the cornerstone or the centerpiece of Christianity is founded on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, when he heard of this, when news reached him that this is what was happening in the church at Corinth, the Bible says he began to challenge that error. He began to challenge that teaching and how many of there are a lot of uh, 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 false teachings nowadays a lot of them especially in the so-called uh, Christian uh, uh, television uh, people they, they, they go off and, 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 and all that uh, but sad but true it begins to permeate in the believers in the church and they begin to uh, uh, lean towards that but Paul our text tells us he begins to combat this era uh, 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 and he begins to establish uh, a doctrine more firmly in the minds of the people because this was a shepherd. He was a pastor and he was concerned with uh, uh, the, 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 the consequences of believing such era. We see in verse 3, the Bible says uh, he, he delivers that which he had received from the risen Christ. So here is Paul, he says, listen, I am, I am, I am, I am a testimony of the fact that Jesus is alive because what I have, I could not have it because it was delivered to me by Jesus Christ who has risen. Uh, verse 3, the Bible says, For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So here he is. He's not just defending it out of his own mental ascent, out of his experience. He's saying, what I'm saying is backed up by scripture. He says, A Christ did died for our sins according to the scripture so we see uh, uh, again here uh, in our text uh, that uh, uh, the basis or the foundation of Christianity number one it lies on Christ having died for our sins if you are here tonight and you're a Christian and you do not believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins then I, I, I question your Christianity because that is the basis of Christianity number one that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures if you know your Bible, in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesied of Jesus Christ having come on the face of the earth and dying on the, on the cross for our sins. David, he also spoke of this. But the second thing that we see, uh, which anchors Christianity together, is that uh, yes, he died, but Jesus Christ was buried. And the reason is simple. Uh, why are people buried? People are buried because they have died. Uh, uh, and so here it is that burial followed the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It reveals to us the reality of death. But the third, and I believe is the most important, is that not only did he, did he die, not only was he buried, but the Bible declares that he rose from the dead. He is a resurrected Christ. He is alive. He was raised permanently, forever. And the Bible would allude to you and I that he seated at the right hand of the Father. And so why is that important that 
thought or that uh, truth is important because uh, in the absence of resurrection, uh, then our faith is futile because uh, we will be just like any other religion. How many know the Buddhist, uh, the Muslims, uh, they, they will tell you that Prophet Muhammad lived and Prophet Muhammad died and they'll go and show you where they, they buried Muhammad and even their bo the bones of Muhammad are there. But ours tonight, uh, we serve a resurrected Savior, which uh, demonstrated uh, a power that God uh, 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 laid, uh, placed on Jesus Christ's body, uh, arose from the dead. And so here is Paul. He doesn't just cast a blind eye to this false doctrine, uh, false teaching which had crept into the church at Corinth he challenges that teaching with the biblical truth he says listen I am a personal witness of the resurrected Christ because at my conversion it is him who appeared to me and he spoke to me and so I am I am speaking this on firm ground because Christ has risen and so he knows that the resurrection of Jesus is a cardinal issue to the Christian faith. Verse 20 of our text. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. The Christ of the scriptures. He must die. He was buried. But he is not in the grave. He is risen from the grave. Whilst on earth with his disciples, he was very open with them. He was very open about this fact that he would die. He spoke about it plainly. He prepared the minds of his followers that, listen, I am not going to live forever here on earth. I have a mission. And the moment I accomplish the mission here on earth, which will culminate with me dying on the cross, I will die. I will be buried. But the story does not end there. I will resurrect my God, my Father who raised me up. And so he spoke this plainly. John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You know your Bible that he was pointing at the physical temple, but in essence he was meaning his temple, his body, his physical body, that when this body is destroyed after three days, I will raise myself up. But the, the onlookers were looking and saying, look, he's, he's, he's saying he can destroy the temple uh, which uh, our, our forefathers built for many, many years. Uh, it took them a lot of time to build this. But little did they know that he was speaking in reference to his to his own body uh, later on as uh, he's fulfilling that word that scripture uh, in luke chapter 24 he's on the cross uh, the bible says now on the first day of the week uh, very early in the morning uh, they, they 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 and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared but they found the stone rolled away from the from the tomb then they went in and did not find the body of jesus christ and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this that behold two men stood by them in shining garments verse 5 then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth they said to them why do you seek the living among the dead why do you seek the living among the dead he is not here but he is risen remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying the son of man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day arise again. And so here is the angel. He's reiterating the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. He says, listen, you are bothering yourself coming to a place of the dead looking for someone who is alive. He is not here. He has risen. Why are you here? Because you cannot find a living man among us the dead. Why? Because God for filled his scripture and rose him from the dead. Let me look then secondly at the resurrection hope. The resurrection hope. Paul, in his defense of Christ's resurrection, he drills in this point. He doesn't just wishy-washy about it and say, okay, you, you can believe what you believe uh, and we will be believing what we are believing uh, and then we'll discover the end of time uh, who is right and who is wrong. No. <laughs> he drills in this point, verse 17. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. And those who have died in this faith they have perished. 
What is Paul saying? What Paul is saying is, the truth of resurrection anchors our faith in God. It is the anchor to our faith in God, this truth that he is not dead, that he is not still in the grave, that he rose in bodily form. The grave is empty. The tomb is empty. That's why I have, a, I have some reservations with people that wear a cross. With, uh, with, with, an, with, 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 with an idol on that cross. In the name of, this is Jesus. He's not on that cross. If you want to be more, spir- more uh, 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 not spiritual, more religious, wear an empty tomb. <laughs> it's more representative of, uh, of the fact that he has risen. Eh? In, engrave a tomb and they show that it's empty. Because he's not even in the tomb. He has risen. And Paul drills in this point. So then what's the hope of our resurrection? The word hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire. So the hope of resurrection is that this life is not all there is. This side of heaven, no matter how beautiful, no matter how uh, glorious, no matter how magnificent, uh, we may leave this side of, 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 of heaven. Uh, listen to me tonight. This is not all there is. That's the hope that is found in resurrection. That there's another life. We may endure hardship. We may endure difficulties. We may endure pains in body. We may endure uh, 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 frustrations and losses in this life. But listen to me tonight. This is not all there is. There is a resurrection. There is another life. There is an afterlife tonight. And Jesus demonstrated that when he rose from the grave. And he says, so shall be whoever has a faith in him. This side of heaven is not all there is. Those of our close relatives who have died believing. Those who have died in faith. Those who have died saved. Have a hope of resurrection to a better life, to a better place. Why? Because of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. He's not in the grave tonight. And upon this foundation which is the resurrection of Christ, Paul the apostle builds the whole structure of the Christian faith. The death of Christ will avail us nothing if he's not risen. The death of Christ will bring to you and I no benefit if he's not risen. He will just be like any other man. But how many know tonight? Christ is the, is, is the difference maker. Christ is the difference maker. People will profess to know a God and they will agree that there's a God in heaven. There's a God somewhere. But access to that God is what matters. And Christ is our access to that God. He died for our sins. But he must be raised and exalted with God uh, to God's right hand where forgiveness uh, could be preached in his name. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. The Bible says, Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So here is uh, uh, what transpired. When Christ rose from the dead, the Bible says... God has exalted him uh, 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 to be a prince at his right hand uh, to be able to dispense repentance and forgiveness of sin. If he's still in the grave, that he cannot do. If he's not raised, there is no hope for man. Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's the fact that he's alive that he brings salvation. 
It's the fact that he's living, that, that he's no longer dead, that he's able to give you and I a, a, a salvation from our sins. Here the writer says, we shall be saved by his life. Because he lives, we are able to face our tomorrows. The tomb is empty. He is risen. He's not among the dead. He is alive. Seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible would give us insight. He says, He is making intercession for you and I on our behalf to the Father. He is an advocate. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. But this hope is a very specific kind of a hope to a specific people. This is not a hope to all. It is a hope specific to those who are dead in Christ. That they shall rise again. Paul is not speaking about a general resurrection. He is very specific in our text. He is speaking about a resurrection of the dead in Christ. Verse 22. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ, even so in Christ, shall all be made alive. Verse 23. They that are Christ at his coming. So he's giving us this hope, but this hope is anchored on us being on the side of Christ. That when he comes and we are on the side of Christ or we have died as believers, as saved men and saved women. He says there's a hope for you and I. Let me close then and look at the resurrection body. The resurrection body. I'm not the longer you stay alive, the more our bodies decay. I know some of you, uh, macho, youthful men, don't believe me. <laughs> but, 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 but just put it, put it on your shelf. Remember it after 10, 15 years, then you'll know what, what I'm saying is true. <laughs> I was with a pastor friend this morning and he has an airport here. And so he was saying he's going to the, he's going to the barber shop. And so he's saying, ah, last time, but what else can, what else can be, what cut can be, can be, can be done for you, my friend? <laughs> There's already an example given here. What cut can be done for you? Why? Because the longer we stay alive, the more our body degenerates. But our text gives us insight that we have new bodies, resurrected bodies. He asks a question, Paul, in our text. Verse 35. He asks a question. He says, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come with? How are the dead raised up? And with what body will they come with? That's verse 35 of our text. I didn't read it, but... Verse 36, he says, Foolish one, what you saw is not made alive unless it dies. And so in essence he's saying, it will not be the same body that is sown in the grave, thank God. There will be no deformed bodies in heaven. There will be no crippled bodies in heaven. Scripture says, what you plant is not what you receive. You plant a seed, but what comes up is a whole different tree altogether. And so that's number one. Number two, he answers, he says, it will be a God-given body, verse 38 of our text. 
But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. And so God will give us these resurrected bodies as it pleases to him. Number three, it will be an incorruptible body. Meaning, verse 42, the Bible says, So also, in the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Some version says, it's sown in, in a perishable state, but it shall rise up imperishable, meaning incapable of death ever again. No disease, no decay, no affliction in that resurrected body. It will be a body of power, verse 43. Not subject to the laws of this earth, verse 43, the Bible says. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It will be a spiritual body. Entirely subject to the volitions of the blood uh, uh, and of the spirit of God. Verse 44, the Bible will tell us here, it says... It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So then, with that being said, as I wind down, let's consider the resurrection incentive. And the word incentive here, I use it deliberately to mean our motivation or our encouragement in regards to the resurrection. How should we live our lives with this truth, uh, this foundational truth uh, that, uh, that uh, Christ rose from the dead and because he rose, he's the firstborn. And the Bible says all of us uh, who believe in him, whether we die, uh, when we die believing in him, the Bible says we shall also rise. And so let's rewind the tape. Uh, while we are still alive, what should be our incentive or our motivation in regards to this resurrection. And he closes, Paul, with an exhortation. Verse 58 of our text. Therefore, so wherever you find the word therefore, you should look what is above it. It's a connecting word. Simply means, in line with what I have said on top, so we have analyzed what he has said on top, which is, in a, in a nutshell, uh, the fact that, that Christ resurrected from the dead, and because he resurrected from the dead, we too, should we die, we shall equally resurrect. And so in light of that knowledge, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. That's the incentive. Be steadfast. Be steadfast. Seeing that there are such glorious prospects before us. There is this resurrection of the body should we die. There is a hope beyond the grave. When that time comes, Paul says, when, when, with, with that there is a resurrection, but he says, in light of that, you must be steadfast because this resurrection is not for the weekly, for the, for, the, for the today in, tomorrow out. He says you must be steadfast. There should be stability of character for you as an individual. In your faith in God. Be ye steadfast. Some, word, some version says immovable. Let not the unbelief of others turn you aside from the faith of this gospel. It's very easy for people that have been steadfast for a period of time. But challenges of life when they come, disappointments of life when they arise, delays of life when they come, frustrations of life when they come, a person who was steadfast 
you see them begin to waver. And Paul says, be steadfast. Be steadfast. Let there be a stability in your faith in God. He continues. Be steadfast, immovable, immovable. So just, let's just do a, a rewind of our life. Are we still where we were? You know, what, people say, no, I want, to, I want to progress, I want to progress. It's, it's, it's good, but, 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 but one thing in life is sometimes it's just best to just maintain what you have <laughs> before you can think of give me more give me just maintain what you have just 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 god god this which you have entrusted in me uh, I, I know i'm a leaky vessel i know and I, I know i go through stuff but help me to maintain what i have and so he says be immovable are you maintaining what you god entrusted to your hands tonight When we look back, when we started this year and where we are today, are we maintaining that which we was entrusted to? Is our faith level still, at least are you still pushing the same way you were pushing when the year started? Or have we just, just uh, reduced in our commitment levels? He says, be immovable. He continues. Always abounding in the work of the law. That's a tough one. Always abounding in the work of the law. And so he's speaking of a constancy of service. Constancy of service. Not hit and miss. A consistency. But this world is filled with one hit wonders. Something big is happening, I will be there. Is it loud? Is it, is it big? Is it, uh, I will be there. Count me in. But to be consistently abounding in the work of Christ, with or without the limelight, with or without the big bang, with or without the loudness, it's a very rare trait nowadays. And Paul says, in light of the resurrection that is awaiting the believers, this is how we ought to live. We must be steadfast, number one. Number two, we must be abounding in the works of the law. Our service for God. If, imagine a scale tonight. Imagine a scale. On one hand, you have your service for God, and on the other hand, you have your service for self. Which way will it tilt? Which side is heavier? Because Paul says, it's not me. Me, I'm just reading his words. Paul is saying, we must abound in the works of Christ. So imagine a scale. On one hand, your works. On the other hand, his works, which we are supposed to be doing. How is the scale tilting? He says, we must. Remember where we're coming from. In view of this resurrection. This is what is expected of our lives. Always abounding. The NIV says, give yourself fully in the work of the Lord. Give yourself fully in the work of the Lord. Knowing that it is not in vain. For in the resurrection state, and at the judgment seat of Christ, 
the reward will be given. Because on that day, what will matter is our works for him. Our works for him is what will be put on that scale. No, but, but I was, uh, but, but I, uh, look at, look at, look, uh, but, no, that, that will burn. That will not survive. What will survive is our works for him. Every man's work, the Bible declares, shall be tried of what sort it is. It shall be tested in the fire. It shall be tested in the fire. In light of this resurrection, our motivation and encouragement should be a stability of character and a constancy of service because our labors are not in vain. And on that day, a reward will be given. I mean, you only reward. I don't know, employers here, do you, do you reward all the worst employee of the year? Simon Kakumbi, so we're going to reward you with uh, a brand new uh, Toyota Vitz. Does that ever happen? <laughs> I would want to work for, I, would, I don't even want to work for that employer. <laughs> the best employee of the year is the one that is rewarded. The hard-working employee is the one that is rewarded. And God says, on that day, rewards will be given. Guess what? Rewards will not be given to lazy, not hardworking. Rewards will be given to those who are all in. And he says, abounding in the love and in the work of our Lord Jesus. I want you to bow your heads tonight in respect to God and the person that is seated next to you. Appreciate you tonight. I thank God for you. Before we proceed tonight, the anchor of Christianity, number one, Christ died for our sins. Number two, he was buried. And number three, he's alive. He's risen from the dead. Is he alive in your heart tonight? Is he living inside of you? Are you saved? Are you born again? If not tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your heart to Jesus. That this hope of a resurrection can become your hope tonight. It can be your expectation as a child of God. You want to surrender tonight? Your heart to Jesus? Would you lift up your hand and pray with you tonight? You're not saved, you're not born again. But tonight we thank God you're here. You want to surrender your heart to Jesus. Would you lift up your hand, I'll pray with you. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I changed the order of the service. Paul corrected this error. There is a resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose, all those that have died in him, believing in him, shall equally rise from the dead. That is the hope that we have as believers. And he concludes, he says, in light of that, we must live a certain way. Stable in character, steadfast, immovable. But more importantly, we must always be abounding in the works of our Lord Jesus. Whatever that translates to you tonight, Jesus says, or Paul says, you must abound. You must abound. Abound in the work of God. Lay your hands on anything that you know that this is furthering the work of God. Abound in it. And I want to open these altars tonight for men and women to come and find a place to pray. As we rise to our feet tonight, these altars are open. Let's come and find a place to pray as we sing a song tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we give you the praise.